Thanks for coming. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the first half of the talks today. I'm uh, Chris Lofink. I'm going to be talking about metrics, why they're important, how to access them, and what they mean in Cassandra. I'm a senior engineer at Pythian, where I lead the Cassandra practice. Like a lot of people at uh, Pythian, I work remotely, but I'm based out of Minnesota. Uh, I like doing software uh, development, like a lot of people here. Uh, in particular, I do Java Closure and Python, but the language isn't so much as important as just going out there and playing with it. Uh, I like big data. I said it. I'm one of those guys. I, I enjoy having large data sets and then the, the algorithms and data structures involved in, in, in doing analytics and statistics over them. Uh, and I, I like to uh, set my house on fire and electrocute myself, you know, hobbyist electronics. So uh, Pythian's a uh, data outsourcing and consulting firm. Uh, and oops, a little sensitive. So here to talk about Cassandra. Um, from an operations perspective, one of the features that is most loved about this is, is the fault tolerance. And this is when you get that phone call at 3 a.m., particularly if you don't have appropriate escalations or multiple people to handle it. It's really nice so that um, if my phone dies and no one's there to take care of it, the system's going to keep running even though, it ha even though it failed at 3 a.m. until I wake up in the morning and see all the red, red alarms. So that's really great, but it's really easy then to forget about Cassandra because you'll, uh, you won't necessarily uh, notice when things start going wrong because little hiccups and stuff can be uh, easily uh, glazed over. Um, maybe something will go down for a minute or two, one of the nodes, but it'll come back up um, as things get queued up and it'll just keep running, which is, which is great and it gives you a nice buffer, but the problem is, is if, you're, if you're not watching for it and paying attention to it, that can eventually get worse and worse until eventually you can no longer ignore it. And, and that ends up happening after a long time. So um, what we really want to do is, is utilize this buffer, that this time where uh, things can start going wrong and actually breaks. Um, we do this in two different ways. We, we're both proactive and reactive. Proactive being your daily and weekly checkups, and this is something that people should really be doing is, is you just go when you look at the metrics, see how things are going, you know, just a standard health check. Um, and this helps with um, predicting capacity issues. If you see that the utilization is going up over time and you know the capacity of your cluster, you'll be able to predict when you're going to have a scheduled maintenance in order to, to handle that. Um, and it's also something where you can pred pred uh, possibly predict issues before they're even issues. So if there's, for example, a, in your data model, a CQL collection or something, and it's slowly growing over time. If you're not um, capping this or, or if, it's, if you're still doing reads on it, you could eventually end up having really bad memory issues and garbage collection. So if we find any data modeling issues, we can, we can address them before they become a problem as opposed to waiting for the actual crash. But no matter how hard you try, things are going to go down. Uh, you're going to have hardware failures, sometimes catastrophic ones. Some person drives their car into a transformer at the Amazon um, region and takes the whole thing down. Uh, it happens. Um, bugs in Cassandra, it happens. Uh, and sometimes you have users who may use you in ways that your data model doesn't actually support, um, either on purpose or not so much. Um, and this is ultimately where you have your alarms, your metrics, and uh, PagerDuty. I saw a couple people from PagerDuty walk in, so you guys, you guys are awesome. Thank you. Having appropriate escalations is, is really important. But for both of these, really what you need is data. You need metrics. You need to be able to, to form, form the alerts, to be able to see trending, to be able to, to debug problems after they've happened. Um, and this is a, a, a quote from Coda Hale is, you need to bridge the gap between how you think the application's running to how it's actually running. These are really the windows to the application. This, this is how you see how things work. And um, there's probably at least one person in the, the uh, came to this talk expecting that picture, so I threw it in there somewhere. Um, so there, there's multiple ways to, there's, there's a lot of metrics. Um, I'm kind of breaking it down here in between the Cassandra metrics and the environmental metrics. So, the Cassandra metrics, we're talking about JMX metrics. We're talking about uh, Node Tool and Ops Center and stuff like that. And that's what I'm primarily going to be focusing on this talk. But I am going to give some honorary mention to some of the environmental metrics, um, in particular logs and 
a lot of the kernel-based metrics, so disk, CPU, memory, network, things like that. Um, so just having the data isn't important enough. You really need to have context to it. Otherwise, you just have a pretty graph. That's very helpful. It's nice to have the dashboard in your NOC for your, for your, to show your manager and show them all the pretty dots so that way everyone's happy. But you really need to understand what they're meaning. And so as I'm going through this talk, I'm going to try to provide some context. I'm going to try to explain it. But I can't go into too much detail just because of the time limits. So um, I'm going to give a really high-level overview of a lot of the subsystems. So JMX, um, a lot of people here are probably already pretty familiar with them. They're pretty standard with Java. They're pretty complex. Uh, there's a lot to them. But we're, at this stage, just going to consider them objects with attributes and operations. Um, a lot of Java applications, Cassandra included, use this pretty extensively for monitoring and, and user input. Um, it's pretty annoying. It's very slow. It requires Java to access. Even if you're using, you can use things like Jalokia and stuff to access it through other um, languages, but you still need that Java wrapper. Um, it's had memory leaks in some versions of the JVM, and uh, it's been pretty frustrating from your oper for an operations team in general, primarily because of this, this mechanism that JMX uses, where when you make a connection uh, to the JMX port, it's actually going to reply back with a different host name and port tuple that you're going to then reconnect to again. Um, and of course, initially, that, that port was random, which makes it virtually impossible to set up a firewall and still have this work. Um, in the more recent versions of the JVM, there is an option that you can use to uh, set the port that uh, the, re the second connection uses. Um, and it can actually reuse the port that the initial JMX port used. And this is actually configured by default in Cassandra after 0 0.8. That's a newer version, so some people haven't gotten to that yet. So you can set that attribute yourself if you're using a newer Java 7 JVM. There's a lot of ways to access JMX. Uh, Visually, you're going to have JConsole and Visual VM. And these are things that come with the JDK. So a lot of people will actually already have this on your computer. And providing the uh, firewall issues aren't going to be causing a problem, you can actually just connect to it right from your system. Um, but ultimately, I think it's really important to become familiar with the, JMX, with the command line versions. So the JMX term is a great one. And that way, you could just SSH to one of your systems and quickly uh, poke at something that isn't exposed elsewhere. Um, there's also MX4J and Jalokia, which are pretty great if you don't want to use Java at all, because then they'll provide like SOAP and uh, REST wrapper for your JMX interface. So JMX looks kind of like this. There's beans, your objects, which have a domain and then a series of key value attributes. So here we have an example. We have Compiffian, and then just a set of attributes to narrow down what that bean is for. So it looks hierarchically hierarchical. But this first level, the domain in Cassandra, uh, originally had four different domains, the DB, internal, net, and requests. So these are, um, they're not deprecated. They're still there. They still work. But uh, as of, I think it was 1.1, one, one, they switched to having this new domain metrics, which actually contains all of the metrics that you need. Everything is there. You don't need to access the old ones anymore. Um, the first attribute in this is a type. And there's a lot there, and I'm not going to walk through them or anything, but um, that type is the first attribute. After type, majority of all of these um, beans are going to have a scope and a name. The scope may or may not be there. Three uh, special cases are the thread pools with a path, column family with a key space, and uh, the key space with the key space but no scope. Um, all these metrics uh, come from Metrics, which is a toolkit made by Coda Hale at Yammer. And it's uh, pretty great, actually. I, I, I'm a fan of it. Um, it's really easy to use. There was a project I worked on where uh, we actually had about a total of 50 metrics total in the entire application. But then at, we, we installed this, and we started adding things, some dynamic and such. And within three months, we had, over, we had thousands and thousands of metrics that we were able to collect. And, and it just becomes interesting trying to store and, and keep all those. Um, if you are familiar with Java, it's, uh, it's in GitHub. It's pretty e easy to look at. So you can just open it up, and it gives you a good understanding of how it works. Just open up and look at the source code. I'd highly recommend it. And it's really popular and used in a lot of projects. So 
Um, in metrics, there's a bunch of different types, that, and Cassandra uses pretty much all these. Uh, the first and the simplest is a gauge, which is just a value. And that can be a string, an array of strings, it can be uh, an integer or whatever it can, whatever. A counter being something that's incremented or decremented, pretty self-explanatory. A meter is just the rate of things. So you have the number of requests per second or the number of requests per minute. It's, it's all um, depending on your units. Um, and it keeps one, five, and 15 minute moving averages. There's a histogram, which gets a little bit more interesting because this is where we have the statistical distribution of your data. Um, it keeps um, a bunch of percentiles and then the mean, uh, average, standard deviation, and all those. So what this is is more if you have something like a payload of a, of a request and you want to keep track of how big those payloads are. If you just keep the max, min, and average, you can end up with something where, well, the max is two megs, which can throw off the average a lot because in reality, um, you could say that the 99th percentile is 100 bytes and it's just you have one that's thrown one huge outlier. So having the statistical distribution is really helpful to understand uh, outliers and actually how the data looks. Um, and then there's a timer, which is one of the really common ones, and that's just a combination of a meter of the events of whatever's happening and a histogram of the duration that it took. So here's an example of how one would look inside of JConsole. We have a histogram of the write requests um, from the coordinator perspective. And one of the nice things is this includes the, the units inside of it. So I'm able to read this and say that, well, the 75th percentile is 683 and the latency is microseconds. So I know that 75% um, took 683 microseconds or less. Um, and then the same goes with the meter side where I can say that there's been 13,000 calls per second. And I'm able to just uh, um, read that right off there, including all the metrics, uh, including all the units. So this can be a little overwhelming. There's a lot of attributes, there's a lot of operations, and there's a lot there. Um, and there isn't really any documentation to explain them, so you ultimately have to end up going to the source code to figure it out. And even then, between versions, they move, they change, they get renamed, so it's, it's really hard to follow. And this is where there's this really great tool, Node Tool, which I'm sure everyone in this room has used. Um, and the, all that is is a command line wrapper around JMX. And so similar to JMX, it has a lot of options and there's a lot of things. I can't go through them all here, but I'm going to go through some of the ones that I think are the most important from a monitoring standpoint. Um, TP stats. Now this is the thread pool statistics. So what the thread pools are in Cassandra is, Cassandra is based off of a staged event driven architecture. So this means that it takes a bunch of common tasks and breaks them into thread pools. And then it just throws a queue in front of each one so each one can just uh, take a task and pass it on to the next. Um, here's a, an example. This is kind of a, it's, it's kind of a simplification of, of the process, but it's, it's, a, it's, I think, a decent one. So let's say we have a read request come in on node one. This is going to act as the coordinator. And it's going to look at it and see that the data exists on node 2. So it's going to create a task and put it on the queue for node 2's read stage. So it's going to, one of the threads in that stage is going to take off the task and process it. And then build up another task, which is going to then go back to node 1 in its request response stage. And this is going to then have a reference to a callback that was created when the request first came in. So then it can return to the client saying that it was completed. So um, that's just, it's a simplification, but it's, it's how things work. And then optionally, that requ request response stage may, may randomly, it's 10% uh, by default kick off a read repair. When it does that, it'll create another task and push it on its stage. Now that's um, interesting because you're outside of the uh, uh, feedback loop from the actual request being made. So, you can potentially, if those read, re, read repairs are taking longer than the number, than how long the requests themselves are taking, you can actually end those having those queue up eventually, um, which is what you want to watch for. You want to watch for these things not being, these individual stages not being able to keep up with the load given to them. 
So there's a bunch of stages. Um, I include the JMX path at the top. It's a little harder to read here. But um, the first is the name is actually coming from the scope attribute of the uh, JMX bean. Um, they're listed on the left side. But uh, each one of these is going to have a thread pool. The active is the number of threads in that thread pool that are actively working on a task. Now each one of these thread pools are going to have a different amount of threads in them. Um, but uh, this will at least tell you how many of them are working. The pending is how many are in that queue before um, the, uh, the thread pool. And the uh, completed is how many tasks it, it completed. So blocked is where it gets interesting. Um, you shouldn't see many of these get blocked. Uh, in particular, the uh, flush writer and the replicate on write might get on in 1.2 and 2.0 below. But most of the others, you shouldn't see them blocked. That's when there's a limit to that queue, how deep it can go. Um, and when that limit gets reached, it'll actually block requests from putting even things on the queue. So it'll block the, the, the caller. So that's a really bad thing, and you don't want that to happen. So even if you're missing, the, missing it, so you're, you're pulling it, but you still missed when that block happened, you'd be able to see the all-time blocked increment, so you wouldn't be missing any. There's another section underneath that, the uh, dropped messages. So this is when a task is, is originally started, so it's going to take a timestamp for it, and then there's going to be a timeout associated. So when a read happens, if by the time this task gets to one of the stages, the read timeout has passed since it was created, it's not going to process it. It's just going to throw it away because we would have already returned to the client saying that we had a timeout exception. So we don't bother doing any processing or CPU on it. So there's a lot more to this. Um, and I'm, I don't have time to actually go through all the different thread pools, their limits, and uh, what they could mean. But there's a, a blog post there where it actually walks through them all. So um, these slides should become available. So if you are interested, you can read them there. Um, I didn't get, get all that. OK. Oh, you were talking, sorry. <laughs> uh, OK, yeah, that's <laughs> OK. So no tool CF histograms, or column family histograms, is beneath the, um, in a column family, there's going to be a lot of statistics. Some of those are histograms. This is going to print those out that are all relative. And a column family is just the old name for a table. They kind of renamed them recently. So. Um, that's what it, it's, it's interested in. And you can actually specify which key space. You'll, you need to specify which key space and table you're looking for. Now, hopefully you guys have had um, some uh, exposure to the read and write path. But just in case you haven't, I'm going to give a, a very high overview of it here. Is when a write comes in, it's going to write to an in-memory table. Um, when reads happen, they're going to check that in-memory table and any, any SS tables on disk. So when the writes stack up enough and that mem table gets large enough, it flushes to disk and creates another SS table. So then reads have to access all those SS tables continually, which can become a problem because that can become a lot of disk seeks. So you can avoid reading the ones that don't have the data you're interested in by adding this bloom filter in front of them, which would basically say when you're doing a read, this data that I'm looking for isn't there, so don't bother checking. Um, but it still gets bad. So uh, there's a periodic uh, task that comes through called a compaction that'll merge the SS tables together. Um, so when you're looking at this uh, CF histograms, what you're looking at at the top with the SS tables per read is how many of those SS tables are touched in a read. That's really important because, especially when you're on uh, uh, spindles, is that's going to be pretty expensive. So usually your read latency is going to be pretty look pretty similar to your SS tables per read. Um, and then the write latency is how long it takes to basically write to that mem table, which shouldn't take long at all. Um, there are cases where it can take longer, particularly during a flush. So the um, interesting thing with this, what, how this looks is, is like here I'm saying that 98,000 reads went to one SS table, or that 4,000 reads went to two SS tables. Now, this is a little bit different than how they used to look for people who are familiar with the old style of, of CF histograms, which provides a lot of information, but it's not easy to read. So in this case, we're saying that from the SS tables perspective that um, 
3,000 reads looked at one SS table. And, or that, um, uh, it's even hard look, reading it now. So, or 10 writes took 60 microseconds. So it's, it's, it's pretty hard to read, which is why a lot of times uh, it's a good idea to then do something like take a, uh, uh, use Python or something and uh, uh, matplotlib and just read that in, in and uh, write them out as a, as a bar chart. So that way you can read them a little bit easier. And then here you can see it makes a little bit more sense that well, at uh, you know 24 microseconds, there were you know 70,000 requests, so it's a little bit easier to read that in, in a graph format. So I would recommend doing that. I included a little link to a gist in the bottom there. Um, once again, you could get these slides later and hopefully get that, but it's uh, just an, it's a modified version that someone else wrote, but I kind of made it work. Um, so that's how they used to look. Um, now in 2.1, which was just released today. Uh, it looks a lot different. And this is because instead of being based off of this, these old histograms that were kept and are now deprecated, is this is using actually the histograms that are from metrics, the ones that we've been talking about and showing, that I showed previously. And here it actually, it's a little bit easier to read because you could just say, oh, well, the 99th percentile write latency is 19 microseconds. And it's a little bit easier to conceptualize than saying there's 3,000 at, you know, nine microseconds or something and then trying to, to do it in your head. So this, this is a, it's a lot more convenient to look at. Um, something of interest here is the min and max are not um, there of all time, but the rest of the percentiles are actually of the last five minutes. In particular, it's a forward decaying priority reservoir, which um, doesn't necessarily mean it's the last five minutes, but it means that it, it's um, exponentially weighted to data that has entered in the last five minutes. So when you're looking at this, you're essentially looking at the last five minutes. This is drastically different than the old style and the current in 2.0 and 1.2 and previous, where every time you called CF histograms, it reset, which is great for benchmarks, but it's really inconvenient for um, operations teams and people debugging because one person logs in and looks at it, and then they reset it and everything's back to zero. So then the next person goes and looks at it and it looks like, oh, everything's awesome. Um, so. <laughs> So it's, it's, I, I prefer this style just from the uh, being able to debug and diagnose. It, it's a little bit better. So, um, But there's a lot more statistics to each table. That's where CF stats comes in, which is the column family statistics, um, where you can give an option for specifying a key space or a key space and a table, or you can do the dash I to exclude because exclude starts with I. And, um, in particularly, it's nice to do that. So you do a dash i system, and it will uh, remove the system because you never really care about the system statistics. Usually, well, usually you don't. So, um, at the first indention, there's going to be a couple um, key space uh, scoped me metrics. These are really just the sum and the average of the um, individual key space metrics. So it's really not that useful to look at averages or sums. So usually, just skip by those. Um, each table is going to be it's going to be named at the first one, and then it's going to go into the different me metrics for them. So in this case, we have three SS tables total. Usually, when you see this, this is going to pretty much correlate to your reads per SS table. You're going to see that, or SS tables per read. I'm sorry, where you're going to see usually a three at the highest. So usually, that's going to be like your upper bound, particularly with size tiered compaction. Um, but with leveled compaction, it's going to look a little different. You're going to get an extra line there where it's going to tell you how many SS tables exist at, per, at each level. Um, your reads should only touch one SS table at each level if everything is working correctly, but that's not always the case. Uh, this is kind of how it would look like if that's the scenario, is L0, the first one, is, not, um, is actually using size tiered compaction. And the uh, slash four is basically saying that it's, it's the threshold of four before it would do a compaction. So it should be four at the most, but since it's 14, that means the compactions aren't keeping up, um, which is bad. So moving on, you'll see then a, a batch of information about the size. Um, this usually isn't that particularly interesting, but you know it's, it's good to know and good to see. Um, the met the mem tables is when those writes are going to the in-memory uh, table is how many columns, how many cells exist in it. 
the data size is an estimate, but it's an estimate of how much size in memory that mem table is taking up, including the JVM overhead. Um, and the switch count is how often they get, uh, how often this table has been flushed to it as an SS table. The local read and write latencies and counts are the amount of time and how many times reads and writes are being taken on a local case. And this is not including um, going to the other replicas and stuff. This is just how long does it take to get the data off disk and look at it. So these are usually should be a lot smaller than how long your application sees. Pending tasks is what I like to consider the most useless metric here. It's uh, actually a, um, the number of mutations that are backed up on the switch lock during a flush, basically, which uh, basically you don't need to know what that really means. It's, it doesn't mean much because in 2.1 it, it doesn't even exist. So I would just never pay attention to that one. There's a bunch of statistics on the bloom filters. Um, in particular, the one that I think becomes the most useful to look at is the uh, amount of space the bloom filter takes up. Because sometimes you can sacrifice having the read hit. Um, it all depends on your, uh, what you can accept. But uh, ultimately, if that gets too large, even though the bloom filters are now kept off heap, um, they still need to be read. So when you're doing a read, these bloom filters need to be in memory. So if they're being, if the OS is, is uh, uh, paging them off on a disk, then during a read, they can be pretty expensive. So you, you want that to be a reasonable number based on how much memory your system has. The partitions is just some information about how wide the rows can get, uh, which is why, in particular, the maximum is the one that you care the most about. It's okay for that to get large. Um, I've seen people with 26 gig you know, partitions, partitions, but it's not a good thing. Uh, it's going to cause a lot of, especially during compactions, they're going to be very expensive. Uh, they're going to take a long time. They're going to cause a lot of garbage. And it's, it's not good to have that large. I usually recommend people try to keep that below 15 megabytes. Um, but it depends on your, your data model and what you can accept and what your read and write are like. Um, average cells per slice, that's how many columns are being read during a read. You should keep that below the thousands if possible. Um, but there are scenarios where it's acceptable to be larger. Oops. Ooh, wrong direction. The tombstones is how many tombstones during a read. Um, this, in particularly, will go high if you are, for example, using Cassandra as a queue. You're going to end up where you're deleting things on a partition as you're adding things. This will get very, very large over the period of the GC gray seconds. So you do not want you don't want this in the thousands. If this is in the thousands, you're doing something wrong, you should examine your data model and try to resolve it. Um, we've, I've been mentioning a lot about the column family uh, read-write latencies, but that uh, is useful. But really what you care about most of the time is how long it takes for your application to have these read and writes take. And that's where the proxy histograms comes in, because instead of just being the the local time it takes to, to insert the, uh, the mutation into the mem table or read the data off the disk. This is how long it takes for the coordinator who gets the request from your application to distribute it to the replicas, collect the results, and get it back. This is, this is what you, well, not get it back, not including the network latency. <laughs> so th this is what ends up being a little bit more important from your application's perspective to monitor because this is what's going to really affect you because even if all your nodes are seemingly operating really well on the local level, if you're having any clustering issues or networking problems there, it might cause a problem. So there's a lot more to node tool, um, but I'm not really uh, going to have time to go through them all. So, um, But there are some honorable mentions, things like compaction stats and everything. Uh, I would recommend going to the um, data stacks documentation and uh, reading up on them and, and going through them because you're probably going to use almost everything in it. Um, if you want to get to these metrics but you don't want to just be pulling node tool or pulling JMX, um, the metrics library has a nice interface provided for you where it could actually push the metrics out to whatever you're using. So by default, metrics comes with JMX, console, CSV, and log4j, but um, it has in the, the uh, metrics 
um, library, there is also a Gangla and Graphite, but they're not compiled with it. So if you want those, you have to um, include the jar in your class path. But they are maintained along with the rest of the metrics library. The, there is a lot of community um, reporters as well. In fact, there's probably more than I could list. Um, so, and they're also really easy to create. So if you want, you can just build your own and have it pushed to something. But if you have um, a new relic or something and you want your uh, Cassandra metrics to go to it, it's pretty easy just to, to pump, to set that up. Um, it's easier with uh, console, CSV, Gangla, Graphite, and Riemann because you can, there's just a YAML file that you can configure the metrics to use. Um, unfortunately, if you're not using one of those reporting interfaces, you actually have to create a Java agent to run as a pre-main and set up the, uh, the reporter. So this is how things were done previous to 1.2, uh, and you still have to do it if you want to use one of those uh, specialty config, uh, reporters. Um, something that I think everyone in um, any Java developer, anyone who's worked with Java has experienced is garbage collections. Um, I, in particular, uh, love them. I think they're really fun. I like tuning them. I love the metrics. I love how complex it is. I think it's interesting. So, fortunately, it's, it's a whole other talk in itself, but uh, if you're interested, uh, come talk to me sometime and I'll, I'll love to rant. So, um, something you should do with Cassandra every one should do with Cassandra is enable the GC logging. There is virtually no overhead in it and it provides a lot of information. Um, there's no reason not to do it. Um, to do it, there's a, in the Cassandra env file, is cassandra-env.sh, you just have to uncomment out a bunch of lines at the end of it that uh, has all these, met, all these garbage collection metrics. There is one exception to that I would say though, the, the FLS statistics that it, uh, has, I would leave commented. This is a undocumented uh, flag in the JVM, and it, it's gonna provide a lot more output in your GC logs, and it's gonna provide a lot more information, but it's something that any GC viewer or anything you use to analyze the GC logs won't know how to handle. So if you take the GC logs from Cassandra and try to load it in, it's just gonna crash and die. So it's useful for if you're looking at it or you're building your custom parser to look at the logs, but from a perspective of having a nice tooling to look at them, it's not worth it. So I would actually recommend not including that. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot to garbage collection, and I definitely don't have the time left here to talk about it, um, but I would recommend uh, grabbing one of those things like the GC viewer and uh, being able to just open up the logs periodically uh, and look at, at it. Um, ultimately though, I think if you wanna get really serious about it, you should uh, use Python or R, whatever you're uh, whatever statistics package you like to use, and uh, uh, analyze the logs yourself. So, so there's a couple logs in Cassandra, um, and I think it's really important to do log aggregation, so you should have something, Splunk or something, set up to, to do this. But there's two, the system log is the first, which is a rolling log, so you'll see a lot of system logs inside of your, inside of your log directory. Um, and this is just the output from log4j. The log4j output is also um, going to standard out, but you can disable that in your log4j properties if you don't want your output log to get huge. But your output log nowadays is okay to get huge because every time you restart it actually truncates, which is in itself a good and a bad thing. It's also kind of bad because there are some exceptions that will not be logged in the system log. In particular, if a, a uncaught exception gets propagated to the top of a thread pool, it's just gonna dump the error, the stack trace, out to standard error, and it's not gonna be included in the system log. So in those scenarios, it's still good to have the output log captured, or at least maybe before you restart, create a backup, so that way um, you're still able to look at it. Um, there's a lot of system logs that you should also be monitoring just from a standard Linux kernel perspective. Um, this is log, device messaging, and such. Um, there's a lot to monitoring the kernel, which itself is another talk. Uh, and in fact, I, I'm recommending here, uh, Brandon Gregg uh, has a great set of talks and explanations on what you should use to monitor what aspects of the kernel. Um, the JVM has um, a lot 
to monitor as well. Uh, in particular, the two that you should be monitoring is the heap and the threads. The heap, uh, you're already capturing the garbage collection logs, hopefully, from the previous slide. Uh, but there's also um, the possibility to do things like take the heap dumps and stuff like that in case you're having high memory pressure and you want to analyze them on a more deeper level. Um, and JMX provides a way to just trigger a dump with that. Or you can use JMAP to do it as well. There's a, there could be a lot of buildup of threads. It's kind of useful to look at uh, the thread count in JMX just to make sure that you're not uh, exceeding any limits on your, on your kernel or anything. Um, but it's also nice to look at the, uh, what the threads are doing. So you can do that with calling a kill dash three will dump the, uh, the, the stack out to standard error or standard out. Um, so it'll show up in the output log. But you can also um, use JSTAC to print them out. Um, and just having the stack trace usually is enough. So if you have a high CPU load, so your, your CPU is burning and you've, you've kind of gone through some normal diagnostics and you can figure out what's going on, something you can do is, for example, use HTOP. It'll tell you which threads are burning CPU. And then uh, it'll give you a PID, which you can uh, associate with, there'll be a hex number in front of the stack that you can kind of pair them up and, and see what that particular thread is doing. Um, a nice utility that will do it all for you is JVM top. It'll actually look at your CPU burn, what it's doing, and actually do some profiling for you kind of uh, um, not very invasively, just kind of from the outside. So that's a really useful tool as well. Uh, ultimately, you should just uh, record everything you find. Uh, 